The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon to you all. My name is Paula Gonzalez and I am the Senior Manager of Membership Growth for AAPA. Welcome to AAPA's second member-hosted webinar of 2022. It is a pleasure, as always, to share our members' talents and expertise with you throughout the year through AAPA's member-hosted webinar series. I hope those of you who attend these sessions gain valuable insights from the knowledge that our members impart on us. AAPA continues to offer this benefit for our members and new members in 2022. So if there are any potential members or current members who have insights they would like to share with our port members, our supply chain partners and industry solution provider members this year, please feel free to reach out to me after this program. And we, of course, have other ways to connect with our members. So if you are keen to learn about additional opportunities to network and learn throughout the year, please hang around for just a few minutes following the conclusion of this presentation, as I will be happy to share with you some additional ways that you can engage, learn, and network in 2022 through AAPA. Now, I am pleased to welcome AAPA member and the presenter of today's webinar, Dr. Brian Pales, the Principal Engineer of Vector Corrosion Services, or VCS for short. Dr. Pales has been with VCS for over seven years and has over 12 years experience in the evaluation and rehabilitation of civil infrastructure. Dr. Pales has extensive knowledge of non-destructive evaluation, corrosion of reinforcing steel and material testing. He has performed condition assessments on various types of infrastructure, including bridges, ports, dams, buried structures, buildings, and industrial sites. Dr. Pales is a member of ASCE and PCI. He is the ch vice chairman of the NACE Standard Committee on Concrete and is an active member of the Transportation Research Board Corrosion Committee the American Association of Port Authorities Facilities Engineering Committee, and the American Society of Non-Destructive Testing Infrastructure Committee. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brian. Brian, the mic is yours. Well, th thank you very much for the introduction and well done on all the acronyms there. There's a lot to deal with in engineering. So um, thank you everyone for joining me today and uh, I appreciate the AAPA for uh, hosting this webinar. Uh, today, I'd like to present on the rehabilitation of reinforced concrete port infrastructure um, that really implements uh, corrosion mitigation to improve service life of structures. Uh, you know, when dealing with port infrastructure, uh, you know, marine environments are very aggressive environments, and uh, with today's, um, we need to keep our structures extended service life even further than normal, uh, you know, with reduced budgets, and so you know, the things I'm going to talk about today are uh, tools that can be used to help extend the service life of reinforced concrete infrastructure around the port. Uh, and today I'm going to be starting off with a little bit of corrosion basics, kind of get everyone on the same page about what is corrosion and how it works with regards to reinforced concrete infrastructure and it, kind of similar principles uh, for steel. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about corrosion mitigation and repair with regards to kind of three primary projects that I'm going to present. Uh, the first one will be at Port Canaveral with a zinc metallizing job, uh, then a Port Corpus Christi with embedded anodes, and then Port of Houston with jackets. And so I'll kind of, I'll present all these different kind of corrosion mitigation service life extension methods through these projects that were completed and uh, how they're implemented on uh, these different ports to give context to how they're used. So to start, um, corrosion basics, that's, you know, first get everyone a, a little bit of background information on what we're dealing with with regards to corrosion uh, in a port environment. So the corrosion reaction, um, you know, most people associate when they think about corrosion, they think about rust, red rust, and that's actually only one part of the corrosion reaction. Uh, here we have a diagram showing the corrosion reaction. And we have the anode here, and the anode is where iron loses an electron becomes iron oxide. So this is where the rust occurs, is at the anode. So whenever we think of rust and we think of the orange or red rust occurring, that is one part of the actual reaction. That's the anode part. So this is where the sectional loss occurs. This is where the iron oxide is formed. But if we all remember back to high school chemistry, which may be further back than others, 
uh, you know, that electron that's freed has to be consumed somewhere. It has to have a balanced reaction. So that electron has to move over to the cathode, be consumed by oxygen, water to create hydroxyl. And that's called the cathode. And so that's the balancing part of the corrosion reaction. So we, whenever we have an anode, we have to have a balancing cathode. Um, and they're connected by a metallic path between the two of them so that they can transfer that electron. And because it's uh, corrosion is an electrochemical reaction in that it's a chemical reaction and electrical reaction, there has to be an electrical circuit current between the two. So we have also ionic current flow through an electrolyte. Um, and so that completes the circuit loop between the anode and the cathode. So these are the four primary parts of the corrosion reaction. Now the electrolyte can be concrete, can be soil, can be water. Um, and these are electrolytes that allow for ionic current flow. Um, and so this is our, our general corrosion reaction. Now, if you kind of take away nothing from this diagram, really the key thing to kind of take away is that the anode is where the section loss occurs and the cathode, there's no section loss. Um, so when we go to start talking about cathodic protection and corrosion mitigation to protect our structures, really what we're talking about is let's make everything the cathode on our structure so there won't be any section loss. And we'll get into that as we move along. Uh, environment, you know, environment is important with regards when we want to talk about corrosion. Uh, you know, at port facilities, we're kind of typically dealing with three primary environments. We've got the marine splash zone, which you've got the tidal zone where you've got water moving up and down, and then you've got wave action and splash action that kind of extends that marine splash zone. The tidal splash zone, the marine splash zone, that's going to be your most severe zone of corrosion activity uh, because it has wet drying cycles, uh, high oxygen availability. Ex typically, you know, for uh, coastal structures, it's going to be high exposure to chlorides and salt water. Uh, and, you know, if, if brackish environments, it'll still be have salt water there. So this area receives a lot of moisture, receives a lot of chlorides, receives a lot of oxygen, and goes through these wet drying cycles. So that makes the marine splash zone in a very, very aggressive zone for corrosion activity. However, we don't want to downplay too much the other two zones. The submerged zone is the zone where obviously everything is always submerged. While, you know, we have plenty of water exposure, chloride exposure down there. We're going to have less oxygen exposure. However, we still have oxygen there and there still will be corrosion activity. It just may be slower than the marine splash zone. I think a common misconception I hear people say sometimes is, oh, that's submerged. There won't be any oxygen for corrosion. Well, that's not necessarily correct. There's plenty of oxygen in water that can allow for corrosion in a submerged state. Uh, obviously, we have plant and marine life underwater, so they have to survive with oxygen. So there is oxygen there, it just may be a little bit slower reaction than the marine tidal splash. Then we have the atmospheric zone. That's, you know, when we're at the coast, we smell the salt in the air so that, you know, the air carries moisture and salts in it that deposits onto structures in the air and causes corrosion. So again, you know, we have less moisture, less chlor chlorides in that marine atmospheric zone, but it's still corrosive and can still lead to deterioration. So these, you know, we classify these three ranges and we do different things to mitigate corrosion in each of them. For direct, you know, steel structures that are directly exposed to the environment, um, you know, typically, you know, the things that we're worried about with regards to corrosion that causes corrosion on them is, you know, we're looking at what's the pH of the environment. So, you know, water obviously is around neutral, but if you've got soils in contact with steel, the pH of the soils are gonna come into play. Temperature is very important. Uh, you know, hotter environments are gonna allow the corrosion reaction to occur more rap rapidly than cold, colder environments. Um, moisture, you know, I talked about the wet drying cycles, ion content, whether you're in, you know, salt water, brackish water, fresh water, that's gonna have a big influence on on your corrosion reaction time. Uh, oxygen content of the water is important. Um, you know, warmer waters actually hold less oxygen than colder waters. So say we're in the North Sea, which is very cold water, that actually has a lot more oxygen in the water. So the corrosion rates are high there. Whereas say the Gulf of Mexico, which is very warm water, holds actually less oxygen. So the corrosion rates are comparably a little less than say the North Sea, which would be cold and have a lot of oxygen. Even though the temperature would be regulating the corrosion reaction a bit, the oxygen availability uh, affects the rate as well. Uh, water velocity is very important when thinking about corrosion in port infrastructure. 
Uh, you know, we have ships berthing at these docks, and so bow thrusters and propellers um, are near various elements on the structure. So those elements can cause a washing effect to occur on, say, steel structures or other structures that that wash away, build up corrosion products, that expose fresh steel to the environment, which causes faster corrosion. Um, also, if you know, if the river water has a high velocity, that can cause um, you know, fresh steel and fresh, you know, material to be exposed and it allows for corrosion to occur much faster. And then obviously our coating qualities, you know, protection and things like that. With regards to concrete, why we like steel and concrete is because of the alkalinity of concrete. So concrete protects steel from corrosion. So if we have a new concrete structure, the concrete will have a pH of around 13 and that high pH will protect the steel from corrosion. So the concrete, it really acts as a barrier, just like a epoxy coating would on steel, you know, coating on top of, you know, steel inside of concrete, that concrete is a barrier to it. It protects it from chlorides and other harmful contaminants that would get into the concrete to cause corrosion of the steel. Now, that barrier isn't perfect and chlorides will eventually reach and get into the steel and cause corrosion of reinforced concrete, but it is an initial barrier that provides some service life there. Um, and that alkalinity of the concrete provides a good barrier. So even though when chlorides do start to get into the concrete, those chlorides uh, take a while. They have to build up in concentration to cause, start to cause corrosion. The damage we, t we see on concrete, so when we think of reinforced concrete and we think of corrosion deterioration, we think of concrete spalling off and falling off the concrete structure and the cracking. That's kind of visually a lot of things that people uh, jump to and you can kind of see here's um, you know, a, a cap that you can see where there's red rusted rebar and concrete spalled off. Well, the damage relating to um, corrosion deterioration from steel inside concrete is really due to the expansive product, product uh, expansive properties of the reinforcing corrosion. So as iron becomes iron oxide, it grows in size. So iron oxide can be seven times the original size of the iron. So that is a very expansive product. So inside concrete, that steel, as it rusts, it grows, it expands, it causes tension in the concrete, which causes the cracking and delamination. And so it's that expansive rust that causes the cracking and spalling of the, of the concrete. When we look at corrosion deterioration, nowadays there's different reinforcing materials that are used out in the industry. Um, you know, the most common would be your conventional reinforcing bar. You know, those are in structures, they're solid bars. Um, they're not under a, a large amount of stress. And so when we start seeing corrosion deterioration like this, where we have a column and we have rebar corroding and some concrete spalling off, you know, while this is an issue that we need to address, typically we're not concerned on a structural level that that column is, is deteriorating to a point where structurally we have to do something. Now, aesthetically and durability wise, we should do something to keep it in service and, and extend the life, but obviously we're not gonna take that element out of service because we're worried about structural damage because the amount of corrosion it takes to cause that spall has only done a minor amount of section loss to that rebar. And that rebar is under a low amount of stress, so a little bit of section loss isn't a big deal. However, nowadays we're using high strength uh, tendons uh, in pre-stressed and post-tensioned elements. These high strength strands are, you know, wires that are, or bands of wires uh, that are, are pre-stressed to high loads and then cast in concrete or, or concrete is put together and then these, these um, tendons are stressed afterwards at high levels. So these high strength tendons have a, a, a very large load on them, high stress, they have a small surface area or a, a small cross-sectional area. Um, and, you know, structurally they play a significant part in the element. Um, so here we have a beam and a spall is formed and you can see that the pre-stress strands have fully corroded by time that spall is formed. So while in both photos we have a similar kind of damage, we have a much more aggressive structural problem on the pre-stressed element than we do on the conventional. And because it takes a lot, you know, it takes the amount of same amount of total corrosion product to cause the spall in both instances, but because the high strength strands have a smaller diameter and are under much more stress, that little bit of corrosion has a significant impact in their 
um, in their uh, capability to, and you can see they failed. So that little bit of corrosion has gone much further as where on the conventional bar, we may have only gotten say 10% section loss. On the high strength strands, we're at like 100% section loss. And, and so that's obviously of concern. If we're not seeing the corrosion activity until it becomes at this stage, that can be a structural issue. Um, and so it's always important to understand the kind of elements that you're doing within a, in a port infrastructure. If you have these precast elements or post-tension elements, maybe we need to be looking at those sooner before the visual signs of deterioration are there, because once those visual signs are there, that deterioration may be much more aggressive than it would have been on, say, a conventional reinforcing structure. So that's a little background on corrosion. Um, so how do we mitigate it? How do we protect reinforced concrete structures from it? Um, so there are several different ways. Um, you know, typically first step is barrier coating. So for steel structures, we use a lot of epoxy coatings and other things like that. Uh, like I said earlier, concrete is a form of a barrier coating. Uh, you know, we use barriers to keep the steel protected from those aggressive ions or water and other things. However, you know, barrier coatings can only last so long. Uh, we also implement uh, cathodic protection, and that comes in two forms, galvanic and impressed current, which I'll talk about. Um, and also nowadays, we're also using more corrosion resistant materials. There's a lot of new uh, reinforcement steel grades and things like that that can be used to help improve the durability of coastal infrastructure. Uh, stainless steels, uh, um, steels that are clad in stainless steel, um, epoxy with zinc coatings. Um, there's all sorts of different reinforcing steels now. Uh, and now they're even using carbon fiber, non-metallic bars. So carbon fiber, glass fiber, um, basalt. So there's, there's a wide array of, of corrosion resistant or improved corrosion resistant materials out on the market these days. So when looking at new structures, um, you know, using some of these materials can really help to improve the durability of port infrastructure by extending the service life of those elements and not having to worry about corrosion. But today's talk, I'm really gonna focus on cathodic protection of existing structures. Um, and so cathodic protection, if we, we go back to my earlier slide there, if we make everything on our structure the cathode, we will not have any section loss. And that's really what cathodic protection is. It says, okay, if we have a structure that's at risk for corrosion, if we make all of our structure the cathode and we make something else the anode, then we will have protected our structure from section loss. And there's two main types. There is galvanic and impressed current. So galvanic um, is where we take a galvanic anode, we directly connect that anode to the steel we're trying to protect in an electrolyte. So here you can see we have the same corrosion reaction that I was showing earlier. We have an anode, now we have a cathode, we have a metallic path, and we have an ionic current flow. Galvanic anodes supply will sacrificially corrode, giving up their electrons to protect the steel, to create that cathode. That cathode. Typically, the galvanic anodes that we're dealing with are going to be zinc, aluminum, and magnesium. And because the reason those three metals are used is because they're less noble than steel. So they're going to sacrificially corrode to protect steel. Um, most commonly, so aluminum is going to be used any ports that are on the ocean or marine salt water environments. They're going to most likely use aluminum anodes because of the salt water. Uh, more kind of inland structures are probably going to be using zinc because zinc will work better in brackish and freshwater environments. Uh, magnesium would typically be used on, in soil, so pipelines and other things like that are protected commonly with magnesium. Um, and so we can size this galvanic anode based on the environment and how long we need to protect this structure. We can determine how many electrons we need and with that number, we can figure out the mass of the anode. And so we can figure out the mass of the anode to protect that steel structure. And in short, really that galvanic anode is just giving up electrons to protect the steel. So if we need a system, if it really is just giving electrons to the steel, well, we can get electrons from a power source, say from our AC outlet. That's, that's a, I mean, quote unquote, unlimited source of electrons. And so we can use, so impressed current cathodic protection is where we say, okay, let's take a source of electrons, say um, AC power, we could use solar power, wind power, 
anything that generates energy, we can use that, have those electrons delivered to the steel. And so that's what impressed current cathodic protection is, is we take a source of energy, we convert it to DC power. So if it's AC, we have to convert it to DC and then push it onto the structure. Obviously with something like solar or wind, it's already in DC, so we don't have to, we don't have to rectify it. And so then we push those electrons onto the structure. And then we, we still have to have an anode, uh, a delivery system, but this anode is now a stable anode, unlike in galvanic where that anode will corrode and deteriorate for ICCP, it's really just a delivery method. So we use something like carbon tubes, uh, titanium with mixed metal oxide, uh, high cast silicon iron anodes. You know, there's a bunch of wide array of different anodes on the market, but these anodes are a little bit more dimensionally stable than galvanic anodes. So as we push the current through them, they don't degrade quite, they don't degrade that quickly. And so now we can adjust, we have full control of the amount of electrons coming out of our structure. Um, and so in more aggressive environments, we can turn the dial up, um, we can turn the dial down. Um, you know, if we have a lot of steel to protect, we can, uh, you know, supply a lot of current. So we have a lot of control with an impressed current system that we maybe won't have with a galvanic system. However, we have to be cautious in that. Now we have external electronics, right? We have power sources, we have wiring. So that system now needs to be monitored and maintained to have an effective service life. Uh, you know, the benefit of galvanic systems is that they're kind of a set and forget. You, you install them. If you do the connections properly, then you can kind of let it be. And it'll last for its service life without much um, without much touching or uh, messing with. Whereas impressed current systems really require monitoring and maintenance. And if, if you have those systems at your port facility that you are, and they're not being regularly monitored or maintained, that is something that is really critical to their effectiveness. And I, I highly recommend everyone to look into that. So when we look at those systems, you know, we really want to look at, you know, design parameters, you know, service life, um, you know, Galvanic anodes can, you know, between 20 to 30 years, depending on the anodes, ICCP could be longer, but obviously monitoring and maintenance is important. Um, you know, environment is, as I said, different anodes are used in different environments. Uh, you know, what the coating, if the structures are coated or not, that, that has a big influence on the size and, and uh, scope of your cathodic protection system. Uh, and something now that a lot of people are dealing with is microbiological induced corrosion. So there's little microsulfite uh, eating uh, microbes in the mud and water that will cause corrosion of your structures. And if you have those, you have to actually drive cathodic protection much harder to protect those structures from corrosion. So it is possible to use cathodic protection to mitigate um, microbiological induced corrosion, but you have to adjust the parameters of your system a little bit higher. So with that primer, I want to now start getting kind of the fun thing and talk about a few projects where, uh, you know, implemented cathodic protection on reinforced concrete infrastructure for ports. Um, so this is Port Canaveral. Uh, this is um, as in Florida here. So uh, NASA is just off to the north of this photo here. So the rockets launch right over there. Um, so it's quite fun to be down there during a rocket launch and you, you can see uh, they go off quite regularly now. Uh, and so here you can see that this part of the wharf has, this is the North Cargo Terminal. And so they have various docks and berths here. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is the North Cargo, this, this cargo pier over here. Um, this was repaired and actually won uh, an International Concrete Repair Institute Award of Merit. Uh, so this was kind of a, we submitted, we had actually done this work a while ago and it's it's doing nice to extend the service life of the structure. So this was a kind of award of a merit for longevity. So this was submitted recently to show like, hey, this is an effective long-term repair that they've done here. Um, so what was happening, this is a reinforced concrete pier. So it has precast deck panels above, um, has beam uh, bent caps here and then piles driven down. So these are pre-stressed concrete piles on reinforced concrete caps with precast panels sitting on top as the dock. And you can see, uh, here's an example of some of the deterioration on the beams. So on the, on the pier caps and beams, there was corrosion on the bottom half of those. Um, you can see here on the right, there was cracking like this and spalling like this on the bottom of that. Because, you know, these beam caps and bent caps, they're right near, you know, you can see in the photo here, they're only a few feet off the water. And when high tide comes in, you can see kind of high tide sits at the, almost at the top of the pile here. So 
the bottom of these uh, bent caps and beams are getting splashed on with direct marine salt water. And so the bottom half of these beams tend to start to corrode, crack, and delaminate. And this is a really common problem with, with beams and bent caps for docks and marinas and things like that. Uh, typically, the bottom half of those are very susceptible to corrosion deterioration because of this wave action. Um, and you'll often get this kind of very representative crack down the bottom half here. And often that's just the result of this bottom reinforcement corroding and delaminating that information, uh, that, that steel. And so here's the design that was kind of uh, put together. This is kind of just an example, but effectively you've got the reinforced concrete cap. And so new galvanic anodes were going into the repairs. Uh, this image actually shows that for this particular repair, they're all going at the bottom half of the, uh, of the, beam, of the beam cap. Uh, and so what that looks like is, is here. So this is a distributed galvanic anode. So this is a galvanic anode repair. So you can see that what they've done is they've chipped off the bottom um, bit of the caps and beams, and then they're gonna reform and pour that. And so the, at the bottom here, you see, it looks like kind of a two by four. So that's a galvanic anode, it's zinc. It gets embedded in the concrete and it will provide protection to that steel reinforcement and stop it from further corroding. And here's a little bit better photo of, of that. Uh, and so you can see here, there's the rebar. They've chipped off the bad concrete. They've cleaned the steel. Now next, they're going to set up forms and pump and fill this with uh, con reinforced concrete. And again, here you see these gray bars are the, are the zinc anodes. One thing to kind of be cognizant of here is that the anodes are actually, the zinc anodes are actually encased in a mortar. So I mentioned back that the reason for the concrete damage is the expansiveness of the zinc oxide. And so if we're gonna mitigate corrosion through galvanics used in reinforced concrete, right? So if we encased all of this in concrete and the zinc starts to corrode to protect the steel, but then the zinc causes cracking and delamination because of the corrosion product, then that really doesn't address the problem. Um, so we only use zinc in reinforced concrete repairs because zinc doesn't expand like rust like a uh, iron oxide does. So when iron corrodes, it expands and grows. Um, magnesium and aluminum, the other two galvanic anodes, those expand just like rust, the uh, iron oxide does. They expand multiple times their size. So those kind of products you do not want to put inside concrete because even though they may mitigate corrosion on the rebar, they would then just cause cracking of the concrete again. And so it's kind of defeating the purpose of the anode. However, zinc, when it corrodes, it doesn't expand a lot like, like the other metals. So whereas iron may, uh, you know, seven times its original size, zinc will only expand, say, 10%, so like, you know, 0.1. So it's, it's a very small expansion from the zinc oxide. And so when you're putting zinc inside reinforced concrete, they have these specially designed mortar encasements to help keep that zinc oxide contained and doesn't cause cracking of the concrete. So that's an important thing whenever putting galvanic anodes in, inside a reinforced concrete that you're not just putting the metal itself in, it's, it's gotta be within a protective material to make sure that the expansive products don't cause any damage. So that was the, the beam cap and the uh, pier cap uh, repairs, but also there was deterioration on the panels as well. So these is the precast panels of, the, of that dock. So you can see here, here's the beam cap or pier cap. And then you've got these precast panels that go between that. And you can see, obviously there's a lot of corrosion deterioration on the underside of these because they're not that far off the water uh, at high tide. And so the method of rehabilitation, obviously the concrete needs to be restored. The concrete, uh, the steel reinforcement needs to be cleaned and repaired. Uh, but to preserve the structure, a zinc uh, surface applied arc sprayed metal was applied. So this is called metallizing to some people, arc spray, uh, thermal, uh, thermal spray. This is where they take uh, zinc, they melt it in an arc welder and spray it on the surface of the concrete. And then that zinc will sacrificially corrode and protect the steel. And this is very, very similar to say, um, galvanizing a structure. So galvanizing steel, where we would hot dip galvanized steel, that's pr now protected in a zinc barrier. 
well, obviously we can't take this structure and go hot dip galvanize it, but we can kind of take the the galvanizing to it, right? We can take this welder, spray that zinc on the surface, that zinc will sacrificially corrode and protect the steel within. Um, and so this is a galvanic cathodic protection method that works really well as a surface applied method. Uh, it's really more effective when you're not directly right on the water. So, or you don't wanna be, you know, we wouldn't do this on the, on the pier caps because they they might get submerged at times. And so we don't want something that'll submerge these. So this is a better option for the underside of the panels because they'll get some um, intermittent spray on them. But for the most part, they're dealing with atmospheric uh, corrosion, uh, not direct submerged or tidal zone corrosion. And so the galvanic spray works better in that environment. And so here's just kind of a schematic of what that looks like. Uh, you can kind of see here at the bottom, you put a couple of spray layers of the zinc metallizing, and then that system is connected to the reinforcing steel through a rod and the plate. And so this provides an electrical connection between the anode and what you want to make the cathode. And so doing this procedure, you then allow that zinc will sacrificially corrode and protect the steel on the inside of that structure. Uh, this is what one of the sprayer units is. So you see here, we've got two reels of the zinc. And so we're using typically at 99.9% .9 purity zinc. So that's it's pure zinc really that comes off those wheels, uh, goes through the welder and is, uh, and is melted and sprayed onto the surface. And you can see here, it's obviously quite uh, messy work. So uh, forced uh, ventilation hood uh, ventilators that they have to wear during this, but you can see, um, a few, he stands about a foot away from it and just works back and forth spraying the, uh, the zinc metallizing on the surface of the panels. Um, and so him, here again is, is the gentleman working. And so they're just, uh, they've pre-cleaned all the surface of the concrete. One thing you'll notice is it's a little hard to see, but there's little tabbies on the concrete. So those are little pieces of tape. Um, so that's a QC process. So what they'll do is they'll put little one square inch pieces of tape every so often on the concrete and then they spray over all that then they peel up that tape and measure the thickness of the metallizing to make sure that they are meeting the proper specification typically for something like this you'd be putting it on 15 to 20 mil thickness and so this is kind of what it looks like as it's being progressed so you can see this flat gray color that's the zinc metallizing uh, and this is the concrete that has yet to be zinc metallized. And so it, it just leaves it kind of a flat gray color and that will uh, sacrificially corrode and protect, protect the structure. And so again here, you can see the panels have been metallized. Uh, they're in the process of, of doing the bottom of the pier cap repairs right now. And so they'll form and pour this. And so again, you know, the metallizing is great when it's a little bit higher off the water. Uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily metallize uh, the cap as a repair because with the direct water exposure, it would cause that zinc to corrode too fast. The next project I'm gonna talk about is um, Porta Corpus Christi. And this actually just won the award of excellence at the International Concrete Repair Institute. Uh, that, that, by the way, that's an organization, you know, I'm, I take part in uh, looking at really understanding concrete repair strategies and, um, doing effective concrete repair work to extend the service life of structure. So very similar to what I'm talking about today, that organization is really interested in. Um, and so we did this work and they won an award of excellence for that. Um, and so this is, these are two oil docks at Port Corpus Christi, uh, four and seven. Uh, so these docks were, you know, marine coastal environment. They were starting to corrode and deteriorate and the owner wanted them to be rehabilitated. Um, so this is kind of what the main dock looks like. It has, you know, various uh, columns, piles, and uh, reinforced concrete beams. Um, and so based on um, what the owner wanted was to have all these different elements repaired uh, because they were starting to corrode and deteriorate. So in the original RFP, the owner actually wanted to, to spray metallize and do the metallizing procedure on all the beams and columns of the, that oil dock. And so that was the original plan, uh, which, you know, like I said, can work really effectively in reinforced concrete near a coastal environment. Um, 
And so, you know, with the metallizing process, it requires one thing I didn't mention is, you know, it requires a lot of surface prep too, because you, you're requiring the zinc to bond to the surface. So you have to do a lot of sandblasting and cleaning beforehand, and then you can spray on the system. One of the interesting things of this job was the kind of initial bid scheduling constraints. Uh, because it is a working oil dock, and obviously we don't want to interrupt that um, unloading and loading of oil, because uh, obviously that's a money maker for the port. So the port had a very strict schedule about days of being allowed to work per month. And in the RFP, kind of an example here, you kind of had, you had three one-day windows, you had four two-day windows, and you had one three-day window. So those were like the continuous day windows. And then you had 14 total days in a month to get work done. And so with metallizing, that's kind of challenging because there's a lot of prep work and then spraying. So if you're in the middle of something and then you have to stop work, that can be, you'd have to then effectively redo that work. And, and so, um, so the bids came in very, very expensive um, on the initial RFP for the, for the port. So because, you know, zinc metallizing is almost all hot work. So we obviously can't do hot work when there's a ship berth. Uh, it requires sandblasting on the concrete surface, uh, arc spraying uh, is obviously hot work. And then, you know, connections to the concrete, to the steel require um, drill holes. And so that's hot work as well. Um, and then, you know, prep work can be lost due to an outage. So, you know, if you only have one day of work to do, you have to do all your prep work and all your uh, zinc metallizing in the same day. Um, and if you don't get it done, then when you come back, you have to redo some of your prep work. So there's a lot of work, you know, in the bids, there was a lot of risk about having to redo work, uh, you know, environmental controls and stuff. And so the bids came in really expensive due to the limitations because it was an oil dock and there were a lot of limitations on hot work. Well, what, what I did was I ended up kind of working with the port and saying, hey, look, I understand what you need to get done. You need to get cathodic protection for your structure. You obviously need to keep this structure in operation with an oil terminal and you can't have hot work when that boat is there. But can we look at a cathodic protection system that maybe allows us to be more efficient? Because zinc metallizing, it just has too much prep work that if you don't do your metallizing immediately after the prep work, then you're never gonna be able to get the work done. And so we looked at doing drilled in galvanic anodes. Um, and so while this work would still require, so effectively what we're looking at was, could we, instead of doing a surface applied anode, could we drill in and grout in a galvanic anode? Uh, we'd still have hot work that'd be required to drill the holes, but we can do grouting and wiring during a ship at birth because there's no hot work involved there. Um, and so what we ended up working with the port was designing a, a, a galvanic slash impressed currents two-stage anode. Um, so this is kind of an interesting product. It combines both galvanic and impressed current into a single drilled in anode. Uh, so here you have a piece of zinc that acts as a galvanic anode, but here you have a battery, an alkaline battery that provides an initial impressed current discharge. Uh, that discharge passivates the structure, creates passivation, and then the zinc metallizing takes over, or the zinc anode takes over for the service life of the anode. So this two-stage anode gets drilled in, and then that protects the structure from corrosion over 20, 30 years. Uh, and so it's a little bit more, normally this would be more expensive than metallizing, but because of the hot work limitations, this was actually cheaper because you don't have to redo work, all, you know, with the metallizing, if you do some prep work and then you don't finish that work and get kicked off site, when you come back, you have to redo prep work. Where drilled in anodes, when you have hot work openings, you can just drill anodes into the concrete and grout in anodes. Um, and if you get kicked off, you just walk away and it's not like the holes will disappear, right? They'll stay there. So all that prep work you did isn't lost every time you have to step off site for an oil, oil birthing. And so in the beams and columns, anodes were drilled in on a grid based on the reinforcing pattern, and the anodes were grouted into those locations, and they'll sacrificially corrode, and the press current system will discharge to provide corrosion cathodic protection to the steel reinforcement of those elements. And so here you can kind of see they're working on putting those into those beams. Um, they were on the elevated beams under the slab and also on the, the waterfront beams. So you can kind of see here, they've got platforms right at the water and they're doing the beams and columns as well there. And so, like I said, 
from one side, these anodes get drilled into about the center of the beam and grouted in. Um, and then they're all wired together with simple button connectors um, and some wiring. And, and then they're connected to the steel reinforcement here like that. And so, you know, again, they're just going in. And so when the ship is at berth, you know, they can go do the grouting work, which is just with a bag and some cement, and they can push that material and grout those anodes in. So at least they're being, they're being productive on shutdown days. So that made the project a lot more efficient from a cost point of view. And so while normal circumstances, metallizing would have been cheaper had it been a, you know, kind of average dock where you could just metallize whenever. Since it was an oil terminal with hot work limitations, this became a more effective solution. And so you can kind of see here, here's some uh, drilled in holes. And then again, those are all grouted in and that's what it looks like. And then this project had some monitoring to uh, monitor the performance of the system. So reference electrodes were installed in various elements so that we could monitor the performance of that system. And so this is kind of, this is what it looked like when it's completed. You can't, you know, you, you kind of see right here, there's some repair work. And so that's where the anodes were installed on the top of these beams. Um, and then again, here's the re finished repairs. Here's a little junction box for a monitored area. And so some various areas were monitored on the structure. And so here's a, you know, various monitoring junction boxes where people can come with a multimeter and just monitor the performance of that system. And then here, here's kind of a, a close up of what that panel is. Uh, it has the anode connection, the structure connection, um, a shunt to measure the current between the two and then an on and off switch uh, to, to do some diagnostics, um, and then the reference electrode. So this allows the owner or owner's representative to go in and measure the performance of those systems. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today is jackets. Um, in marine infrastructure, uh, you know, jacketing piles and columns is a very common uh, repair strategy. Um, here you can see, here's a, here's a dock, and you can see jacketed of the, of the piles here. Um, jacketing is where you kind of take the original substructure, whether it be steel or concrete. Um, sometimes you encase it in new reinforcement, sometimes you don't, depending on the structural capacity of it. Uh, and then you put a stay in place form that's either plastic or uh, a PVC or fiberglass. And then you fill that annulus with grout to provide, um, and you have galvanic anodes inside that jacket. And that provides cathodic protection to the, the tidal splash zone of these piles. Um, it's very effective in the tidal splash zone. That's where you get really aggressive corrosion damage. And by applying that jacket there, you can get very good corrosion protection. Um, jacketing's been around for a long time as a repair strategy, but cathodic protection jackets is a little bit more recent. Uh, one thing to kind of keep in mind is um, it's really critical when doing jacketing to have cathodic protection in the jacket. Um, it was actually discovered, so back in the 50s in Salon, uh, people have been doing where they just do a grout encasement of a pile with a fiberglass form and they didn't do any cathodic protection. And what they ended up finding was that the corrosion either kept going or accelerated within the jacket because there was no corrosion mitigation. The original thinking was by putting the jacket on, they would mitigate corrosion activity by the reduction of oxygen, um, which is really hard to do. Trying to keep oxygen out of something is, is really almost impossible. So while the idea was, you know, kind of theory was sound, in practicality, it really didn't work. Um, and unfortunately, corrosion would continue on on those piles. And so there's a, a, a pretty important report from Florida Department of Transportation who did a big study on pile jacketing with and without CP and found that without CP that the piles were continuing to deteriorate and or accelerating to deteriorate um, and, and the jackets did nothing to repair it. So, and, you know, really critical to have cathodic protection included as part of the jacket. And so what that means is um, here you have a CP jacket. So it's a fiberglass or PVC form. And then you have some kind of zinc anode inside that jacket. So when you put that around the pile, you grout that in. And so then that zinc will sacrificially corrode and protect that pile. Uh, below the waterline, you have just a bulk anode that protects everything that's submerged. So the jacket is really for that tidal splash zone where the, an where the structure might go into the air. Uh, remember I mentioned that the anode has to be in the electrolyte. So if the, um, 
if the water level drops, this bulk anode can only protect what's in the water. So by adding the jacket and the cement, you create an electrolyte around that pile and you're able to protect much higher up on the pile. And so then here's them grouting that, that pile. And there's all different forms of different anodes. So this is a, a zinc mesh anode for kind of tidal zone areas where you have a lot of wetting. Um, if you wanna protect higher up on the pile, these are wicking anodes. So there's a piece of zinc inside a fabric that draws salt water up higher. So that protects a little bit higher elevation on a pile than, than the mesh jacket would. Uh, and then even further up, if you have problems a little higher up, these are self-activated anodes. So they don't rely on the salt water because the salt water is so far below them. These anodes are like the ones I showed you in those beam caps. These are sink anodes inside cement mortar that then get a case in a jacket to protect the higher elevations. And so depending on the environment of the pile, different jackets are used for different procedures. Um, and so this is a, this was done recently at Port of Houston at various um, of their facilities. Um, and so they were doing some expansion for the bigger cranes. And so they were doing some repairs to their piles. Um, and so underneath there, this is what it looks like, very cavernous, uh, uh, dark area. And so they have big round circular piles. And so on some of them, they were starting to deteriorate. So they started doing uh, jacketed repairs for the tidal splash zone of those piles. So here you can see on the left, this is a fiberglass stay in place form jacket for the tidal zone. Um, and here, this happens to be a PVC jacket for the tidal zone, just happens to be different contract phases. Uh, one thing you'll notice is um, they also zinc metalize the upper elevation of the piles. So on these piles, it hasn't been done just yet, but once the jacket was done for the tidal splash zone, the rest of the elevation was metalized to provide corrosion protection for the whole pile. Um, Again, the jacket's important in that tidal splash zone because the zinc metallizing can't hold up in that environment. Um, and so this is, you know, this is them during construction. Um, uh, divers are required for some of these, for these, for this work. So here, um, the generator platform and the guys doing work there. Um, and so here's the jackets, what they look like on a round and square pile uh, right before grouting. So you can see that the stay in place form is in place. Uh, the wiring for the anode is the red wires, uh, and then that'll be connected to the steel reinforcement of the structure. And then uh, come along straps are used to hold the form in place uh, while they're grouting it. Uh, and then they'll take that form that off after grouting. And so the last step is then for them to take the jacket, connect them, wire them up. So uh, there's usually a junction box above. And so the red anode wires uh, are connected to the black structure wires and those are connected through a little uh, box and so you're able to measure the performance of that system. Um, one other neat little thing at Port of Houston is they also had beams there that were corroding and deteriorating. Uh, sorry the photo, it's hard to get good photos under there, uh, but they had beams that were also corroding and so they also did um, horizontal jackets there as well. So, so even though jackets aren't just for piles, they can be done horizontally as well. So it's the same procedure for a pile. Uh, this is a fiberglass stay in place form and they, they put anodes in there, they did concrete repair work and then they pumped that full of grout and you can see the pumping ports there. So, so with that, I really appreciate everyone's attendance today. If there are any questions, I'm, I'd be happy to answer anything. We do have a few questions, Brian. Thank you um, for that excellent presentation. Um, so much, so much to uh, unpack there. Um, I'll start with uh, this question. How significant do you believe microorganisms and or stray electrical current from a high voltage power lines play in exposed steel corrosion like dock walls? Okay, uh, well, there's two parts there. So on the microbiological induced corrosion, um, it definitely plays a part in certain environments. It, it's not a widespread problem, but there are definitely areas that it, it affects more than others. Um, it's simple to test for those microbiological induced corrosion. So if you have corrosion problems on your sealed bulkhead walls, you can get samples of the soil of the mud down there and check for those microbes. So uh, it's not maybe widespread throughout the country. There are certain areas that have it worse than others. Um, but if you do suspect it, it's a relatively easy thing to check for. Um, with regards to the stray current problem on high voltage, um, 
so straight current problems can occur. So straight current, for those of you who are not aware, is where current kind of leaves another structure, causes damage on your structure, and then returns to another structure. Um, with regards to high voltage lines, typically it's more of a problem for oil, uh, for gas lines, for pipelines, because AC induction is really over a long period, a long distance. So if you have a pipe that's following AC lines, it can cause induction along the line over hundreds of you know, miles and whatever. Um, for a port, unless you have the AC lines running parallel with, say, a bulkhead wall, that might cause some problems, but it may not be necessarily your issue. I, I recently did a project in Florida where an oil and gas tenant at a port had their own impressed current cathodic protection system protecting their pipelines, and that was causing stray current corrosion on the bulkhead wall of the owner's of, of the port's walls. And so that was something to be cognizant of because somebody else's cathodic protection system could cause corrosion on your system. So, um, so if you have oil tenants, oil and gas tenants who have their own impressed current systems, that could be something that could cause impressed current or stray current damage for you. Great, thank you. Um, and this next question, I'm not sure if it's complete um, or if you'll understand it. Um, 15 to 20 mil thickness of sprayed zinc. Yep, yep. So that's the zinc metallizing. So that's the thickness of how much is needed between 15 to 20 mils. Yep. Okay. Um, and then this next one is a little long. So um, <laughs> bear with me as I try to read it. Um, okay. When connecting sacrificial anodes to a mesh of rebar, how often do you need to connect throughout the mesh? Does it rely on good connection between overlapping intersections of the bar meshes in order to protect areas where not directly connected to an anode? Related to this, does there need to be a determination on how far down the length of a bar is protected by the attachment of an anode? Okay, great question. So what you're getting at there is called what we call electrical continuity. So whenever we're doing cathodic protection on a structure, we need to make sure that the steel we're protecting is all electrically continuous and that there's a continuous metal path between it all. So for like a bulkhead wall, you know, the sheet piles, they all need to be electrically bonded. Usually we might just uh, weld a seam at, well, do a small weld at every seam. Uh, for reinforcing mats of steel, uh, typical ca cast in place reinforced concrete construction because we do tie wires between the rebar that most of the time will make uh, the cast in place structure completely continuous. Uh, if you have something precast or or epoxy coated steel, then you could have potential issues with uh, electrical continuity. Um, as far as kind of how many connections you need for a structure, it kind of depends, but uh, you know, typically. Um, you know, say for those beam elements that we were looking at earlier, on something like that, you might have two connections per face. Um, you know, usually the specifications for a project like that might say for, you know, every 500 square feet, you need, you know, for the first 500 square feet, you need two connections, and then every 500 after that, you need another, or something of that nature. Uh, but it, it'll be dependent on the elements as well. So like if you're doing piles, you would have two connections per pile um, and things like that. So um, but it's definitely something to be cognizant. You have to check for during construction. You have to check continuity to make sure uh, that all your connections are continuous. And if you start losing continuity, you have to do more connections. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To what extent do deteriorated galvanic anodes affect protection? So as the galvanic anodes start to deteriorate, they won't be able to put out as much current output. Now, a good CP design, so when I design a galvanic anode, you have to design over the life of that anode. So as we design, we, we start to assume it's gonna reduce in section. So I don't only design for year zero, but I design for say year 20. I look at, okay, how much weight have we lost over 20 years? How will that affect the dimensions of my anode? Will it still be able to put out current at year 20 for what it needs to do? So a good CP design takes into account that change in shape, which will, what, what ends up happening is the anodes reduce, because the surface area is reducing, the resistance path between the steel and the anode is increasing. So you have to be cognizant of that, that increase in resistance over the life of the anode. So a good design will take, look at that end of life condition and say, do I still have enough surface area of anode to protect the structure that I need to? Um, so that is really important. And if, if the design wasn't done very well, 
at the end of towards the end of its life, it may not have enough energy or be able to kind of push them off current to provide full cathodic protection. Great. Um, and how often do you recommend inspection of ICCP systems? Um, at minimum once a year. I really recommend more than that, maybe twice a year. If you can do it quarterly, that is really ideal. Um, but at the very bare minimum, you need to inspect them fully every year. Um, but I would recommend a little bit more than that. Because if something happens with ICCP, you won't know until the next inspection unless you have uh, we do uh, nowadays do a lot of remote monitoring of those systems. So with, with remote monitoring technology advancing, we do a lot of setting up data loggers and install that on those systems. And then we can just monitor it from our laptops if there's a problem. But if you're doing on-site inspection, you go one day and then there's a power surge and a breaker trips the next day, you won't know until your next inspection and then your, your structure is unprotected. That makes sense. If you have epoxy bonded reinforcement steel, do you think that CP is needed? Um, and if yes, how do you get electrical connection between the spars? Right, so uh, epoxy coated reinforcement in a marine environment can be not necessarily as durable as most people think. Marine environments are very aggressive on epoxy. Um, and so you are not protected from corrosion forever. Um, and so yes, you can do CP on epoxy coated reinforcement. Um, continuity is going to be an issue. Uh, typically what we would do is what we call a continuity bond groove. So like for example, let's say a pile had epoxy coated steel. What we would do is do a band of chip out band around the circumference of the pile and then weld on a bar to bond everything together. Um, so like if it's a slab, you know, you do a, a, a groove horizontally and transversely and then weld in something to bond everything together. So so you can do CP on epoxy coated, you just have to do the bonding groove first. It's a little bit out of work, but really over the overall construction budget, it's really not a bad, it's not significant. Okay. Um, do you have repair suggestions for concrete that sees somewhat regular but minor wetting from salt water? For example, concrete around mooring points where water from mooring lines will wet the concrete every time a vessel comes in? So yeah, so you're talking more, it's concrete that's atmospherically exposed, but occasionally does get wet. Um, things like a, a silane sealer could be a nice uh, material. Uh, concrete sealers or things that will keep the concrete dry under those irregular wetting events is would be a beneficial um, application. Their silane will get into the pores and, and allow for the protection. It effectively keeps water from getting into the concrete. And there are silane coatings that also include a corrosion inhibitor addition. Um, these can be applied and, you know, they need to be reapplied every, say, three to five years, but they're cheap and they're really easy to apply. So that could be something to be a nice preemptive strategy in an area, you know, that gets occasionally wetting and drying from something like that. That could be a nice, uh, a cheap way to kind of help preserve your air, that area. Um, we still have several more questions that are coming in. I'm glad to see that the audience is so so engaged. Um, are you still good to keep answering questions? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer if they're there. Let's let's, let's okay. Do it. <laughs> That's great. Um, how does oxygen continue to get in contact with the steel in the case of FRP jackets filled with grout? If the jacketing if the jacking is supposed to be impervious. Okay, well, so the jacketing isn't impervious, so the, the it's just a stand place form, um, and it'll most commonly it'll start to debond from the concrete a little bit. It's there more for aesthetics; it's not a seal, um, and so the grout inside of it is porous and has wet drying cycles that will occur into it. So, it so the the jacket while it looks like a nice seal is not not really the barrier or anything that's providing any level of protection. It's just there more for an aid in construction so that the contractor doesn't have elaborate form work. Um, so it doesn't really do anything to the benefit of the structure after construction. Okay, um, 15 to 20 millimeters is a bit thick for a sprayed zinc. Would that be one and a half to two millimeters thick? Uh, mills. Mills, mm. Mills is different than millimeters. Sorry, mm. <laughs> That's the question. Um, it was written as MM, I interpreted it. Okay, yeah. That, that's well, my, yeah. <laughs> my mistake. That, so that's the question, 15. Well, okay, well, the answer is, is it's it's 15 to 20 mils. So it, so that's, that's much, much smaller. 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, the, but his question is, would it be, is it, should it be 1.2 to two mils thick? No, it's 15, it, it is 15 mils. 20. Yeah, it's 15 to 20 mils. mils. Thickness. Okay. What, what but that's is. correct. Okay. Yeah. What is the value of concrete coatings, i.e. bulkhead caps or pile caps above, but near the splash zone? And if so, would CP slash ICCP still be recommended even with a properly coated structure? Well, coatings are great on newer structures when they haven't been contaminated or deteriorated. So as a, as a first line of defense, coatings are great. However, it's really important to maintain coatings. Uh, coatings don't last as long as maybe people let them last. Uh, so, you know, a coating in a direct marine environment may only last uh, 10 years. So if you're not updating and maintaining that coating that frequently, then it won't really provide long-term benefits. And so if you have a new structure that really hasn't gotten saturated with chlorides or moisture, then yes, coatings will be an effective barrier to chlorides and moisture. Uh, but it's not a repair once the chlorides have gotten into the concrete. Once you already start seeing cracking and corrosion, a barrier doesn't do anything to then stop that. So that's where CP really is important. So if you're going to do coatings, it, they're great, but just know that you have to maintain those over the life of that, and, and they're regular maintain it, maintenance there. Okay. Um, has there been any in-service, um, i.e. long-term forensic studies on hybrid reinforcing materials such as MMFX? And if so, do these materials behave similar to their carbon steel reinforced structures with regards to expansion and resulting concrete damage? Um, any other thoughts on these proprietary alternatives to conventional carbon steel rebar? So there are a lot of studies that are ongoing with regards to long-term durability. Obviously, these materials haven't been around for that long, so the studies are still, you know, they've done studies for a year, a couple of years, and shown that, hey, they perform better than carbon steel, but they're short-duration, high-exposure uh, studies. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of promise that they, they do very well in that, in the corrosion durability sense from a you're talking kind of a thermal aspect. So from a more structural uh, point of view, there are some differences in those materials, especially say like the glass fibers and stuff like that. Some of the non-typical metals and stainless steels, those are different ductility and different uh, uh, characteristics than normal carbon steel. So I know there's a lot of research and work out there on those different materials. Uh, you know, that I, I touch on that a little bit. It's not my area of expertise, but um, but there is a lot of research. I know, um, you know, several, you know, the DOTs on the bridge side, they are definitely looking into that a lot. I know the Virginia De Department of Transportation has a lot of research in that area. So uh, they'd be a good resource to start looking for uh, different long-term studies on those kind of metals. Okay, great. Um, and last question, what is order of magnitude cost uh, adding cathodic protection to concrete structures? Uh, I mean, it could be anything. It depends on the structure. I mean, you know, zinc metallizing can cost you between 30 to $70 per square foot, depending on the environment and the, you know, if there's a lot of contractors in the area that can do it. So like Florida, metallizing is very cheap because there's a lot of people do it. But in California, it may not be that cheap because there may not be many people to do it, right? So things like that, it's, it's really hard to say. It's a very big range, but, uh, you know, I would tell you it, does add value over the service life. So if you look at it from a service life point of view, it will definitely add value. Okay. Um, that's the last question that I saw. Um, so it, any parting words before we conclude? Uh, well, I, you know, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, the questions were really great. Um, you know, obviously, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I always, I always love to answer interesting questions like that. So uh, thank you again, Paula, for NAAPA for giving me this opportunity. It was, it was great. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you um, for your insightful presentation. Um, and thank you to our audience. I hope you gained some uh, helpful insights. Um, I know we are a few minutes past our time, but before you sign off, I do hope you'll hang in just for a few minutes so I can share some upcoming events and promotions that I think um, may be of interest to you. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Um, I promise I'll only be a couple, just a minute or two.
and here we go. So we just have a couple of um, events coming up that I just want to make, draw your attention to. Um, our legislative summit is uh, coming up next month. It's our first in-person event of the year. It's taking place in Washington, D.C. from March 28th through the 31st. Um, we have lots of great speakers coming who are going to be coming. We've just confirmed um, Pete Buttigieg, um, General Stanley Crystal, who is the former commander of the U.S. and international forces in Afghanistan. We'll be recognizing our Port Person of the Year, um, Senators Bill Cassidy and Mark Warner. Um, so, uh, and we'll be focusing on um, important port issues such as infrastructure, energy, digitalization, and next-gen technologies. Um, so it's really going to be a, a wonderful event, and I hope to see some of you there. Um, and we've got uh, the, our other in-person events for the rest of the year, our finance administration seminar. That's actually being moved to November, um, so those, that April date um, is no longer valid, but um, that, that event's being moved, but we will, will still be taking place in 2022. Um, our Facilities Engineering Seminar and Expo, for those of you um, interested in today's topic, um, that, that um, seminar I think probably would be of interest to you. Um, that's going to be taking place in Savannah, Georgia, April 12th through the 14th. Um, that, that event uh, I think would be of interest. Um, our Marine Terminal Management Training and Executive Ma Management Conference Seminar, for those who are um, planning on earning their um, professional Port Management Certificate. Um, that event is from April 25th through the 29th. Um, the Smart Port Seminar, that's our information technology seminar. That's going to be from May 18th through the 20th, and that's being held in California. Um, our Shifting Trade, um, that's our global trade event. Um, that's taking place from June 15th and 16th in Tampa, Florida. Um, our Port Security Seminar and Expo from July 12th through the 14th. Um, our annual convention and expo, that's going to be taking place in Orlando, Florida um, from October 16th through the 19th. And that's pretty much, that's like the homecoming event for the port industry where the everyone, um, all of the leaders from the port industry are getting together. So um, that, that, that's like, our, that's our, I don't want to say party, but you know, that's, that's, that's our homecoming. That's where we all get together and, and come together. We haven't seen each other all year. So um, that, that's really where we, we, we get together and have fun. And then the commissioner seminar, um, that's December 6th through the 8th. And then um, we have our mobile app. That's a wonderful way to um, network and connect with members and, and stay connected to the um, news and events. Um, what's going on with AAPA. So if you have an, uh, an Apple or Android phone, um, it's a free app. Um, you can download it um, for free and uh, you can connect with other, other users, other, uh, other members, um, and then um, just stay connected to AAPA that way. So, um, and as I said at the beginning of this program, um, this webinar um, is a benefit for members um, and new members. Um, we, we, let, we let our members host a webinar for free um, to present themselves and their, their thought leadership and their expertise to our members. So if you are a member um, or if you want to be a member and you would like to share your expertise and your leadership to our members, um, please feel free to reach out to me um, and, and we'd be happy to get you on the schedule. Um, so here's my contact information. I'm always happy. And then if you're if also, if you're looking for, for information on how to get more benefit and value from your membership, you want to, to learn how you can um, connect better with, with our members, um, please, again, don't hesitate to reach out to me. That's my role here at AAPA is to help you do that. So with that, I'll just thank Brian one more time. Um, for you for for your presentation and thank you our attendees for your time and attention today um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day take care and thanks so much thank you